Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. My name is Zaki Hassan. I'm here with Pervez Ahmed. We are switching things up and recording at Thalif Collective. That's right. And I think it's kind of uh, telling and opportune because uh, we are so close to our sixth anniversary. In fact, this episode very possibly is our sixth anniversary episode. So, so we are recording near feet. That's right. From where we recorded our very first uh, conversation with Sadie Osama Khan. That's right. And so I think it's very fitting that for our sixth anniversary, we're back. And it's also, I think, not, um, how do I say this, equally? It's, it's fortuitous. Th- yeah, there you go. But but the fact, and, and and that we're sitting across from our guest today. Yes, Because true. this is, at least for me, been a long time wish list, uh, you know, guest. And so we are truly honored. And in fact, I think we, we are breaking norm a little bit because um, our guest, and I'm, I'm teasing and I'm, I know, but our guest is uh, someone who joins us from the United Kingdom. Yes. So, in fact, our first guest who is not American. I mean, he is visiting. sitting here. That's we are right. sitting with him. That's right. At Talif. But in he has California. come here all the way from the United Kingdom. That's right. And our guest is. Uh, we are joined by Peter Sanders, who's the world's preeminent photographer of the Muslim world. For more than 45 years, he has captured over half a million images reflecting a rich, traditional civilization filled with warmth, humanity, and compassion. Peter's physical journey ran in parallel with his spiritual exploration of faith. These journeys led him to document the Islamic world of peoples, architecture, and geography, and also provided him the opportunity to meet with people around the world and photographed aspects of life and society. Peter Sanders, thank you so much for joining us here on the show. It's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, it's it's really is a pleasure. And, and, and as someone who uh, has uh, not only admired your work, but also just really longing to have this conversation because I think that not only just based on your travels, I imagine you have so many stories that you could share, um, but as we often like to do on the show, which is to kind of, if you could talk us and take us to where your story sort of begins. And I don't mean your story to Islam per se, but just your story as a person, as a human being. Um, So you, you obviously hail from the United Kingdom, but if you could tell us a little bit about your, you know, growing up and what that was like and where and um i had a family we moved quite a lot so we lived in different places i spent a bit of a time in in london then we just kind of it was quite nomadic my parents were always moving a little bit so mm, mm. and then uh, were you uh, one of many siblings no, big family small only child. Fam- the only child okay. yes okay so um and then like and i don't you don't have to necessarily date yourself, but um, what, what, was there anything you, sort of unique happening which kind of led you perhaps as a young adult? I'm not sure exactly when you begin to sort of begin your journeys uh, exposing or exploring different faith traditions. Yeah, that came later because I kind of uh, started taking uh, professional f- photographs in mid-60s. Okay. So that's when my photographic career began. So so maybe we can we can... A step backwards from there. Yeah. Uh, what led you down that path? You know, I thought about this a lot. I think always as a child, I was putting like, I was making a frame with my fingers. So it was kind <laughs> of a very natural thing to do. I'd put a frame around and then like, okay, if you exclude that. So I was always doing that. I remember doing that as a child, even before I had a camera. And then, um, so I just kind of fell into photography quite easily. My mother always had cameras. And then I discovered Actually, after my grandfather passed away, that actually he was a professional photographer. And I'd never had that discussion with him. Um, uh, He wasn't very good at business, so I think he didn't didn't do very well financially. But I've seen some of the pictures he took. They're amazing. Mm. And some of of the famous people and things. So he he actually had a studio in the King's Road in Chelsea. So, But I never had that conversation with him. But I used to sit with him. And I remember definitely from sitting with him that he created the love of travel with me. He, by, the, by the time I was kind of relating to him, 
he was collecting stamps and he was always showing me within these little stamps all these pictures around the world and stuff. So he definitely nurtured me, the love of travel and the love of images, I think. Mm, and what a better way to bring those two together, those yeah. two loves, right? Uh, than photography. Um, so, so, so in the 60s, you break through initially with uh, rock and roll uh, artists. Uh, and I'm, to me, that, that's the part that fascinates me the most is to achieve that the notoriety where you're able to, you know, uh, photograph these these quote unquote idols. And then you make the jump where you say, you know, you can redirect this energy in, yeah. in an entirely different direction. I mean, so I, I kind of fell into photography. I mean, I was interested in it. And then um, I got a, like a tax rebate for £60 from the government. And I, at the same time, one of the big studios in London was selling a professional camera for £60. So I bought that. <laughs> and then uh, I met my landlord and he said, oh, what are you doing? I said, I just started doing photography. And he said, oh, the guy who used to live in your uh, house used to do photography, left some equipment, maybe you can use it. So I inherited a whole dark room. I set it up in the... And, you know, I've never, I never studied photography. I'm totally self-taught. Really? So I just started taking pictures. And, and then because I knew people in the music business, that's I started photographing all the musicians. And you have to remember that... They're very iconic, those people now, but at the time they were just what was happening. Hmm. In the so, 60s. Yeah, in the 60s. So the Rolling Stones, I'm thinking British scene, yeah, British yeah. music. So the, 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 the Stones, the yeah. Beatles. See, the, the only one, yeah. the Beatles were already quite big at that point. Of course. So they were quite, so yeah. it was harder to access them, although they were around on the social scene, but I didn't yeah. really photograph them. Got it. But then the others, you know, I could just go and turn up at concerts and just photograph them and just do all this. And stuff. I would imagine anybody listening also, they're probably wondering the same question, which is, uh, do you ever encounter Cat Stevens in the 60s? Yeah, no, but he's 70s, you see. He came oh, later. Oh, that's true. So he's that's early true. 70s, and I'd already left mm. that whole world and oh. went on my travels by then. Okay. But we've known him one another a long time, so, you know, I know mm. him and um, photographed him since since that period. Right, right. So, so leaving that world, uh, how does that happen? So I'm doing it quite intensely for about five years, five and a bit years, and then I I sort of read uh, something in the uh, sort of 69, which kind of woke me up a little bit, that there was a world much bigger than myself. So it was kind of almost like a spiritual awakening, and I started to think about going to India to look for a teacher. See, people either went to Morocco or they went to India. So I decided to go to India on a kind of spiritual quest, but I didn't have the money. And uh, at some point I got offered to go on tour with the Rolling Stones for three months. And I thought, I need the money, but I don't really want to spend three months Traveler. locked up in hotels with these guys because they were getting to quite heavy drugs and things. Of course. So I said, no, I'll give it a miss. And then Jimi Hendrix was playing at the Isle of Wight. So I thought, oh, I'll go and photograph him. And of course, none of us would know. Two weeks later, he would he would die. And I had some of the last pictures of his last performance. So wow. I sold them and got the money I needed and I went off to India. To fund your travels. Yeah. Um, it's fun because he, I know we, we off air, we were talking about one of the intents of this show or uh, sort of unbeknownst to us, even that we would be weaving this tapestry. Something was happening in 1969 because mm. so many people's journey, uh, inward journey begins in 1969. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned to you, we've had Hakeem Archuleta on the show, 1969. Yeah. Um, Esan Bagby, I remember, 1969. They even something in Dr. Omar's life, 1969. Yeah. So it's just remarkable um, that you would cite that as a year. Yeah, and I sort point. of see that as the beginning point of really what I've ended up doing now, Meetings with Mountains. That definitely was a kind of crucial point, which something was planted in my and mind at that time. What do you think planted that, or uh, what was planted? I read a book uh -huh. uh, called uh, An Autobiography of a Yogi, and I've since found out it was Steve Jobs' favourite book. In mm -hmm. fact, they distributed it at his funeral. And it's really about uh, an Indian uh, kind of teacher who travelled around India meeting all the great saints of India and, uh, and then ended up coming to the West. In fact, ended up building a big kind of ashram here in California. <laughs> so he was quite significant, and that... 
I, I kind of think that book was definitely planted the seed of mm. the idea for meetings with Mount. And not not consciously, but right, of course. something inside it about saints and sages. You know. So in, in 69, then you traveled to India. Is that no, 71, I traveled to India. First time? Yeah. Where do you visit? So I go to, I go to India um, and I'm basically traveling by myself. I go to uh, Amritsar. I go to Delhi and I go to Amritsar and I go to a Sikh colony and I meet a Sikh teacher who's quite known to some friends of mine. I liked him a lot, but I realised he wasn't the person I was looking for. So then I kept on travelling and went to various places. I went to the old ashram of uh, Yogananda. You know, I just, Mm. I knew there would be a kind of meeting of hearts when I met the person. Then eventually I went to South India and then that's when I met the teacher that I ended up staying with for six months. Okay, not not Muslim teacher. No, no. Uh, but although he yeah. although he was basically uh, grew up as a Hindu, he yeah. had he had followers who were Muslim Sikhs right. from every religion. He didn't re- he didn't his teaching wasn't just focused on Hinduism. Yeah, you see that a lot. The kind of yeah. syncretism, right? Yeah, uh, especially in India. Yeah, definitely. Right? Yeah. Whether it's the yogis or even yeah. some of the spiritual te- uh, the uh, the the Muslim saints, yes, Haji Ali and others who is following uh, transcends. Religious Absolutely. boundaries. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, what was it with regards to your own religious background that you found not? I don't want to say lacking, but I, that, that that sort of created that inertia for you to want to go out, move beyond. I think, like a lot of people, I was brought up as a kind of Christian. But it's kind of kind of loose. I mean, definitely, I had belief in God, but it wasn't it was was much practical aspect to it so i think you know a certain point probably around about the time 69 i started thinking you know i'm kind of worried a lot and i you know i just i need to kind of resolve all this and it's just start you know you start to see cracks in the kind of your life and how and you need a kind of you need to find a solution so i started doing i started doing meditation at that point, and then things started happening. I started having very powerful dreams and things, and that's what really spurred me on to go to India to look for a teacher. Mm, mm. And so how long do you, sp- you, you spend in India? So I was seven months. Okay. Yeah. Um, does it, like, I guess you, you, you encounter Muslims, but do you visit very any little. of the... Very okay, well, Yeah, I mean, I went to mosques in Alabahad, and, you know, I know actually one of the places I was staying near the ashram, there was a mosque. Right. I used to hear the Adhan being called every morning. So but all the time I was in India, I was reading about other religions. I read, yeah. I read about Sikhism, Buddhism, mm. studied Hinduism, read a little bit about Islam, not a lot, though. Got it. And you didn't visit any of the, like, shrines of, in, in, in India, like Ajmer or No, or not at that or, point, no. Got it. Because when, once I found the teacher, I ended up staying with him for six months. Got it. So did you ever formally embrace whatever, was it really Buddhist teacher, Hindu teacher? I was just no? doing, I was just doing meditation. Meditation, yeah, okay. yeah. So then, um, then do you come back to the UK? So then I came back to the UK mm. and uh, there was a curious phenomenon because a lot of people I knew from the music business before, some of them, musicians particularly, had, some of them had become Muslim while I'd been in, in India. Mm. So that was kind of, oh, that's unusual. And then I had various dreams. One of them, my teacher from India was standing at the door of a classroom and he was inviting me into the classroom. And in the classroom were these friends of mine who became Muslim. So there were certain things happening to me. I felt I was being nudged in this direction, but I still wasn't 100% sure. So I'm fascinated by this. So when you, in, in the 70s, there were mus- musicians in England yeah. who had embraced Islam. Yeah. What sort of led? I mean, do you know anything about was there yeah, yeah. what was I going mean, on? Well, in I the, mean, uh, in the I think, zeitgeist. I think really it was sort of this English group of people who were connected to Sidi and Habib in Morocco. So that's that's the kind of that's mm. the connection. Got it. I, I thought so because then I think of again the, the, that tapestry, right? Uh, yeah. uh, Hakim Archuleta's story. Yeah, exactly. And his encounter. In fact, he was one of the one of the first people that I met after I came back from India. Okay. And so he was quite instrumental and, in, yeah, I feel comfortable with these people, you know. Got it. And finally, you know, it was really about, I wasn't personally looking for religion. I was really looking for something spiritual to practice. Uh-huh. And then I went and had a discussion with somebody about, okay, can you explain to me about Tussle Wolf, Sufism? Mm-hmm. He explained to me these are spiritual practices of Islam, but, you know, you can't take that without 
the body of Islam, you know, that the two go totally in harmony with one another. And that made 100% sense to me. And he said, at some point, you have to enter through the door of Islam. So I said, I'm ready now. And so you, you, we've talked about Hakeem Archuleta and some of the people you encounter. Yeah. I, I imagine just if my history is right, then um, Abdul Qadir is Sufi as well. Yeah. Uh, was he sort of the teacher for a lot of these individuals? Yeah, so he was the person I had this uh, oh. conversation with. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I thought so. And, and then within about um, two or three weeks, I then went to Magnes to meet Imam Nabib. That was for Ramadan. So I, I left the UK and I went when was for that? my first Ramadan. So that's in 71. 71 as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so you all... Now, is it just yourself or, like, all the people that we've been kind so, of talking about? Yeah, so those Padre. people, would, like, every Ramadan, a group of people would go. Would so I went with them to, to meet him and uh, just get my first taste of Ramadan. Got it. And the, now, um, that same group is eventually joined by people like Dr. Omar and Sheikh yeah, Hamza. of course, yeah. So you're, you're still with the group when they come. Yeah, yeah. And when is yeah, that? I met Sheikh Hamza when he was 18, <laughs> We used to also, we used to come here. You know, it's quite interesting because we've been in Berkeley today. I'm kind of this is like memory lane for me because we used to come in the early seventy two, seventy three every year and have gatherings, open public gatherings, and do vicar and you know that's how we met Chapanza and all the people that came from the American me. side. You have to tell us about that. So this was happening in Berkeley. Yeah, in Berkeley. Yeah, which is it's just amazing because we're well, and these are all students of uh, Sheikh. Uh, well, like, they came Muhammad to the gatherings and then they ended up. You know, joining the group and going to Morocco and making that connection. You know. mm -hmm. But he'd already died by then, you see, because he died at the end of 71. Okay. okay. Yeah. So a lot of the people don't so actually meet him. So they don't meet but him. They meet only the very early core. Um, with you, along yeah, with yourself with and your and, contemporaries. Uh, yeah. Uh, meet him. Yeah. Um, and then it's sort of... The, Abdul Qadir al Sufi kind of becomes the, the the sort of head of the group or the yeah well he's the made the, he's made the muqaddam really he's made the muqaddam yeah. okay okay but I sit him on Habib yeah. and that's in when like the late or the, well no the, he's right made the muqaddam from from when Simon Habib was alive and mm. then um, yeah and so yeah. that's that's right. how that group and then it kind of grows and stuff got and it so the first time you meet Sheikh Hamza is in fact not abroad um, but here or you said in Berkeley perhaps. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I met him here, yes. Yeah. You said he was 18. Yeah, so he was I think 18, young. He had a... You could tell he had very bright, you know, <laughs> incredible mind, you know. Mm. Uh, and so then, um, I, then of course, and we don't have to get into the, the what, when, and how, but the, the group sort of fractures at some point. Yeah, it's kind of, I think, if you have a group that's very inward looking instead of kind of slightly balanced by outward looking, I think it implodes eventually. And I think, you know, for some of us, it was not wasn't enough, and I, mm. I'm grateful for it. It was like kind of university I went to, and if right. I hadn't left that group, I wouldn't have met all the shayuk and aulia that I met. You know, went on my own personal journey. Right, right. So, um, yeah, I'm grateful for it. And there was a thing that came from that group, which is a thing of brotherhood. You know, that's right, which is spread all over the world. You know. And the people who were part of that. Yeah, I mean, amazing people, you know. <laughs> really? Incredible. So, so, and then we've talked about, Shaham, like, when, when does Dr. Omar come? Uh, so he comes at some point. Okay. We're just talking you about that. He comes yeah. to I can't remember which year. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember all the year, but I remember him coming. Right. A lot of people came oh, in. Yeah. Some people stayed. Some people just came for a short time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so then, um, uh, so when, once that fracture occurs, yeah. do you go to Spain then? No. Okay. No, I'm. I, I know go, some of the. Groups. I go to yeah. back to London. I go, I go back to London. Yeah. Mm. And then you're still kind of your own journey on your own. Yeah, on my own uh, journey and travel. I'm like, I, you know, I traveled all the time. Just so photography was still, just, and you were. It was a big part of my life, traveling and searching and meeting people and. Yeah. Mm. And, and and also kind of kind of trying to understand the bigger, larger Muslim community. Okay. Because you understand Islam by meeting the people and then you see the things that link them all together. I mean, there's culture, but then there's the, the spiritual, the moral, or the grand aspects of human beings that, you, that link everybody together. Mm, mm. Um, any, so uh, at that time... Where do you travel to that has a really profound 
impact on you? I mean, if you could say everywhere, it, yeah. yeah. I mean, I've been everywhere: Japan, right. China, I mean, you know, Mauritania, whatever, Africa. Right. And then this sort of idea about meetings of mountain begins to kind of really form in a kind of. At first, it's just I'm collecting all these pictures as this kind of album, showing it to people when they come. Uh-huh. And then 80s and 90s, it starts, oh, yeah, this is like a serious project and I'm doing it. But all the time I'm still thinking it's my own thing. I'm not ever thinking it's going to be published or anything. And what is the first piece or a collection of your work that gets published uh, of your travels in the Muslim world? So that's in the shade of the tree. That's the first thing. 2003 actually was published here in, in Chicago and sold out in one year. Was it the uh, Starlight? Yeah, it was Starlight. Starlight pu- yeah, published yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I have, I mean, we were just going through it earlier, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I didn't realize it was Starlatch. Yeah. Uh, what, a, what, what a story. That, that, that's a fascinating story there as well, uh, because they also published the Majestic Quran yeah, yeah. around the same time, in fact. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I think, in fact, those were sort of the first uh, few publications, was yeah. the Quran's translation and then your book. Yeah. And then the after tree. that, I, uh-huh. After that, I started thinking about, oh, I've never done anything about England. I need to do something about England. And now at the kind of that time, the Muslims were being very stereotyped. Mm. So I had this idea about doing a project called The Art of Integration, which was really just to show normal Muslims day-to-day life, just doing stuff, but being kind of British and Muslim. So that kind of grew. And I remember doing a proposal for it. I said, okay, it's 40 days of photography. I ended up working on it for five years, that project. <laughs> And did it ever, like... Yeah, and it went, then it just went all over the world. It was in so many different countries. It was in Baghdad, it was in Timbuktu, it was in uh, Tel Aviv. I mean, it, the thing appeared all over the place. So. Mm. Although I really did it for England. That was the idea. It's only been ever shown in England, I think, two or three times or something. Mm. <laughs> but it got seen all around the world, yeah. Right, right. Uh, and so now, um, I guess... In your travels then, and and you were talking about this sort of common thread once you get to meet the people, um, you know, what are sort of those salient features that that, that do, regardless of the cultural differences that that you find are common to Muslim communities in throughout the world? Well, definitely hospitality, generosity, you know, kindness to strangers, just so much. Mm. I've had such amazing experiences at the hand of people I've just met for the first time, you know. Right. It's amazing, really. Incredible. And and the way you get to meet these, like some of the people whose pictures you've captured, especially in your most recent work, um, some of the mashaikh, the mashaikh and the awliya throughout the world, how does that happen? I mean, is it just, there's certainly, you would imagine, or I would imagine, like you, you'll, you, you'll say something like there's a divine hand sort of guide, guiding all of it, but is it... Definitely, but a lot of it was just following my own instincts. Okay. You know, like Shamsa came to me and said, uh-huh. oh, show me a really, I remember showing me a really bad video of Sheikh uh, Marabat al-Hajj, and he said, oh, I want you to come to Mauritania and photograph him. And I took one look at it, and I said, I'm coming. <laughs> you know, it's just like, okay, I, I have to go and photograph that person. So it was a lot of it, it's just people telling me about that yeah. and it's it's kind of I don't know it's just it just starts to happen and and you know always like somebody you say oh you need to come and photograph my teacher mm. but he doesn't let in you know he doesn't let anybody photograph him and right. I'm going oh well thanks for that you know <laughs> but, I, I it. but it was really not I really wanted to meet them so I didn't kind of it was a kind of okay if I get to photograph them it's an added bonus you know got it but it was really to meet them yeah and I and I learned at some point that uh, Ibn Battuta wherever he travelled he would always go and find the local saints and sages and go and meet them and ask for their prayers and stuff in his travels. So I said, yeah, I want to do the same thing. <laughs> yeah. I, I was wondering if you could maybe talk a bit about, uh, from a technical perspective, I yeah. mean, you, you said to a large extent it's an instinct, it's instinctive, which I believe because you've been doing it so long. Yeah. But what do you determine... Uh, are the factors that are required to make that shot the one worth capturing? What are what are the things mm. that you're paying attention to? You just have to be very observant. You know, most of us are distracted most of the time. Mm. So it's really about being present and just being still and just watching for moment. Because it is, Henry Carter Bresson talks about it, it's the decisive moment. You know, there's a moment. It's not now, it's not now, it's not now, it's now. And you missed it. And it's, you know, it's as instant as that. And it's sometimes fractions of seconds. 
and you can do a whole session of somebody, but there's one picture where you really just got something, you know. And that's just learning to be in tune to that. And that's, I mean, photography is all about using it, trusting your instincts and using what comes from inside. So, you know, I've learned to use that a lot. Right. And I guess as a follow-up on the technical side, um, then how do you determine like lens and lighting and those factors, or do you just let, like you said, it's just follow instinct and, and, you know, or do you come with some sort of a idea of what, how are you going to capture mm, this I, subject? I mean, it's like, it's what I teach in my workshops. You, you need to know all that stuff because if you're thinking about that, when you're doing the session, it's too late. <laughs> you, you have to have all that preparation done before it needs to be second nature for you. Ah, so it doesn't really matter. You know, there's a lot of talk about equipment. It doesn't really right. matter as long as you know that equipment back to front. Because it's not the equipment, it's you. It's you just use that's just a tool you're using. Mm. Fascinating. Yeah. Um, so uh, I mean, going back to in the shade of the tree and, and meeting like Sheikh Hamza's teacher, for example, I think he's actually one of the images captured in that book. Yeah. Um but more specifically, like the collection of, bo- of, of pictures you have now in mm. your uh, meetings with mountains. Meetings with mountains. Is that a, like do you go? Do you set out to capture images for this collection, or is it something that again, it's a col- it's, it's a collection of your travels of the last so many years? Well, it didn't start off yeah. as I said consciously. So I mean, the first person I photographed photographed for it was Sidi Muhammad Habib. I'm meeting him for the first time and then so those pictures in there you know I'm meeting him and I'm photographing him for the first time so at that period I'm also photographing all the people around him because you know incredible people he had scholars he had beggars who were fucking and you know very wide range of people and that's why it was such an interesting thing for me but I wasn't really thinking about it and in fact when it came to do the book the editors were saying, well, you know, what was happening? And I said, I don't know, I just took the pictures. It's just I was just doing what I do. So it's only as the project became more, you know, really got into it that I've started to kind of note what was happening and stuff. But really, uh, the, writing the text was the hardest thing, not not taking the pictures. The pictures is easy for me to do. Is, is it possible that you may have actually captured one of the last images of Muhammad ibn Habib. Like, yeah, he died a couple of months after. I was going to say, because you may have been Even at that time, there wasn't any proper pictures of him. And many of the people in the book have never been photographed before. Because <sighs> I just think of that journey, right? Because you mentioned uh, Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. And, and being one of the last yeah, to capture yeah. his image. And then there you go, from capturing Jimi Hendrix to capturing, you know, Muhammad Habib. And I'm not here to put people in into into groups, but that's just a fascinating journey regardless. Yeah. And many, many of the people that I photograph passed away very shortly after I photographed them. And I got a little bit scared, actually, when I started thinking about it, because right. I thought, if the word gets out, they're never going to let me take the picture. <laughs> and I was talking to Mustafa Badawi in Medina, who's much wiser than me, and he said, no, that's why you're allowed to photograph them. They're, they're on their way out. <laughs> so it didn't matter. And I make this that's point, profound. is that it's, that it's not that they're against photography. They don't want anything that makes them appear as if they're something. It's from humility. Mm. Mm. These people, are, humility is just zero, really. It's mm. just incredible. Mm. And um, and a lot of them had never been photographed before, so that was part of my challenge to how was I going to get permission to photograph them. But well, you have to read the book. It's You know, that is a thread that goes through the book is how I got permission to photograph them. The journey, That's part of the journey. That's part of the journey, yeah. So, so you mentioned writing, like, that the, the text of the book was more difficult. Yeah, because I'm not a writer. You're I don't consider visual. myself... I'm a visual person, right. and, and the text was really... You know, when I started it, I would sort of... I just wrote it all out, and it's, oh, it sounds very emotional. It doesn't really tell what I'm trying to tell. And I had to, I worked with an editor for a year. She really helped me a lot. And I took advice from, from Michael Sugic, and... Uh, but I needed to find my own voice. It's very important. And I wanted to kind of, I don't say de-Islamicize it, but I wanted to, you know, we tend, as a community, we tend to use our own language and everyone is kind of outside of that, is excluded from that. So I wanted to find a language that we can, that I could talk about these things, which are very spiritual things. Mm. And you're talking about things, really matters of the heart. And that was very challenging for me because I wanted 
I needed this narrative which explains on top of the picture what happened when I met these people. Mm. And um, like in, in, in some cases, I imagine you're having to think back to moments that occurred yeah, years exactly. ago. Yeah, exactly. I mean, alhamdulillah, yeah, thank God I have the pictures so right. that can take me back to the time of taking the pictures. I mean, it does. You know, it, yeah, it helps as soon as I see the pictures. Yeah, I'm back there. And we're That's fascinating. It, so. That's fascinating. Um, so with the help of, the, and so I, I guess to tease perhaps those who, who are about to read the book or will read the book, um, what is that sort of like, you, you said part of the journey is, is the, is the ability or the, or getting the permission yeah. to capture these people. And what else is sort of that you found became these sort of overarching portions of the narrative as you're writing it beyond the permission aspect. Of yeah. And then obviously what happened, what kind of okay. exchanges happened in them when I'm sitting with them, uh -huh. you know, what kind of, things that I gained, what did I learn from each of those people? And I was thinking about that today. You know, sometimes some of these people are very, you know, I think people have a certain idea of what a Sufi saint is or, you know, a saint, what a saint is like. And we often think, I think in our imagination, they're very charismatic. Mm. Actually, the reality of them is quite the opposite. You know, probably you wouldn't notice them. Sometimes they're beggars in the street. I mean, it's just God has placed something in their hearts. And mm -hmm. you, if you are not observant, you'll miss it. Mm -hmm. and, and then you have, you have teaching sheikhs. You have hidden saints. You have saints who are so hidden that if you were to expose them, they'd pack up and move to some other city. Their role is to be completely hidden. Mm. I mean, that's why it took me 50 years. You know, you don't, you can't go to the yellow pages and look up saints. You know? <laughs> look up saints in the yellow pages. Yeah. That's and a remarkable them, reference because yeah. the yellow pages, for probably a chunk of our listeners, say, yeah, they probably a, don't even remember that. That itself is a, <laughs> is a marker, a cultural marker. And then the other thing yeah. that, that really troubled me, there weren't many, many women. Because of the oh, culture of Islam, right. it's very difficult. That's a, right. to just photograph women, to photograph women saints is even harder. Mm. Thank God there are a few in the book, not as many as I would like. And I've asked some of the scholars and they just said the men are hard to find, the women are even harder to find. <laughs> but Habib Ali said it's half and half, half women, half men. In terms of the awliya. Wow. Yes. The saints. Yeah. That's, fa that's, uh, that's remarkable. That's profound. Um, and the other thing that he said, which is really interesting, when we yeah. launched the book in Bradford, he was, he was he there. Came, okay. He came to the launch and, you know, I mean, they asked me a year ago, would I launch the book there? And I said, yeah. And then after thought, they said, will you ask Habib Ali to come? And I said to my wife, in their dreams, right? <laughs> How are they going to get Habib Ali to come? And then, I don't know, six weeks later, suddenly I'm standing in front of him. So I think, okay, grab your moment. I asked him, will you come? And he said, for you, I'll come. Wow. And he came. And there were a thousand people there. And he, you know, he is very supportive and he gave a beautiful talk about the saints. Right. But he said a really interesting thing, right. which is really important as a key to the book and key to understanding the saints. He said that by looking at the faces of the saints and the sages and reflecting on them, a narrative begins to take place between you and God. <laughs> Which right. is very deep, actually, if you think about it. That's, it, that's, that's deep wisdom. It is. And because what is it in them? They have some, there's some light of Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in them. That's right. Because they're all from him, from him. He's like the blueprint and they've all come from his light. Mm -hmm. you know? mm. in, so when, when you were talking about the, like, there are saints that are hidden, there are saints that, that, that teach, and there are saints that are so hidden that, yeah. you, you know, even to expose them would be, yeah. yeah. I was thinking about this question, and it very much falls in the line with what you mentioned Habib Ali saying, which is this idea that, because part of any saint, I think, is because we often focus on their writings or their teachings yeah. or their, right, quote unquote, the content that they have disseminated. Yeah. But there's also, in equal parts, their sohbah, just the presence of being with them. Yeah. So what you're, in fact, at least attempting to do, right? Because, I mean, they, they're beyond the pictures or the two-dimensional picture yeah. photograph, um, is to 
is to capture that. Yeah. Right? And many of them are unlettered. I mean, there are ones who are scholars and there are right. others who are unlettered. That's what, right. But they have. And the analogy of mountains, that title came from Sheikh Hamza Meetings with Mountains. That's, which Please. is an incredible, if you think about it, because if you think about a mountain, you oh. see just a certain part of it, but there's a whole bit under the... We don't see the more of the mountain that's actually bedded into the, okay. into the right. earth. And so it's an interesting analogy. So when you say meeting with mountains, so meeting with mountains, yeah. is it, the, who, who's the subject then? Or is it the, the, the mountains people. or the people meeting the mountains? Do you see no, what I'm saying? It's, it's, it could be taken as or read as these are the meeting of mountains, like these great people. No, who, that I consider them the saints and the sages. They right. are the mountains. No, of course. But I do say in the book that a mountain really exists by itself. So there's a landscape of small mountains and then hills and stuff. That's because right. you can't understand the mountain without the surrounding. And so that's, you know, there are some who are obviously great, great mountains of incredible presence. But there are also, you know, saints and people who have their own presence and, you know, benefit that you take from them. And, and I think also on, on that similar note, I mean, you only are able to measure the height of a mountain or its majesty if you're standing at a certain low point. Yes, you have to be that. Right. But there's also, so th there's a guy that I met called Mustafa Salama. I met him a few years ago. Now, Mustafa Salama, Salama is the first Muslim, as far as we know, who climbed Mount Everest. Okay. He, he had a dream that he was standing on the highest summit, uh -huh. calling the Adhan. Huh. He woke up. He asked a friend, to call his friend up, he said, what's the highest summit? He said, it's Mount Everest. He'd never climbed a mountain before. He trained and he climbed a Mount Everest and he called the Adhan and prayed up there on the top of Mount Everest. Right. And then he's since climbed the seven, you know, the, what they call the Grand Slam, the seven highest mountains, he's been to the North Pole and so forth. But when I was asking him to write me a quote for the book, he said when he was climbing the last summit up to Mount Everest, he felt he was with the prophets. So again, you have another analogy of mountains, you see, and That's what, right. what it means, yeah to traverse them or to, or yeah, to reach their when peak. when you get that, you're yeah. in their presence. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, uh, you know, the, the scholars, the ulema wa right? Yeah. The, the scholars are truly Absolutely. inheritors Absolutely. of that legacy. Yeah. So fascinating. Um, mm. You know, I, I must feel like you mentioned so much about the book, like it would have been, we could have done this like oral presentation <laughs> on the, like go through each picture and have you just talk about it. But inshallah one day. Um, th so, so, so tell us, I mean, you're, you're joining us here in California. Yeah. You've been doing this book tour. The book yeah. was released when? Uh, it was released about two months ago, two and a half months ago. It's almost sold out in the UK. Okay. In two months, we've almost sold 2,000 books. I sent a thousand books here with Mecca Books. So Mecca Books is the uh, distributing it here in the States. I Got gave it. them the, Rights to that because I really wanted to get it here in the market here, and it's a bit of we done this tour very quickly. We there's not much preparation gone into it. I just wanted to get the idea that the book was out. Inshallah, I'll come back next year and do a proper, more organised trip, and we'll go to the places we missed out. Inshallah. So, uh, so this tour so far. Where have you gone? So we arrived yeah. on the East Coast, we're in New York, we went to Washington, we went to Philadelphia, Allentown, right. went to uh, Michigan, and then we came to Chicago, right. and then we're here in California, and this is where I'm the last few days now. That's right. Now and I'm going back to carry on the tour, and I still haven't done, I haven't even launched it in London yet, I've done all the northern cities. Right. So what was the idea to, to, to do it in conjunction with... Uh, uh, Michael uh, Sujis' book. It's just we're old friends. You okay. know, um, he always wanted to write the text for my book, <laughs> but I didn't want a Calaver Californian version on it. I wanted an <laughs> English. It needed right. to be in my own voice. So right. he ended up doing signs on the right. He got fed up waiting for me to do it. <laughs> so he did signs on the right. But I like it because his is more a writer's book. Mm. And the stories, some of the people are similar, but the stories are different. So it's, it's nice. The minds are very visual with a sort of less text. That's so right. it's nice. And then he's done his own book. So he's doing, he's launching Heart's Turn. And we kind of, we, we laugh because we're very opposite. Chalk and cheese, right? He <laughs> likes freezing cold, I like heat. 
He <laughs> likes to nap in the afternoon. I like to drink tea. We're complete polar opposites. It's, it's, really like, it's like you and me, Professor. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. It really is. We yeah. always talk about Double how we're the odd, yeah. the odd couple. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. that's how I describe us. <laughs> the odd couple. Right. Who's the Oscar and who's the Felix or whatever were the characters. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's fascinating. And, and it, I'm glad we, we we bring him up because, like, I think a, a great supplement to this piece is going to be um, my interview with him. Yeah, yeah, Chala. very important. So, very yeah, important. I'm He's really a great storyteller, and uh, that's right. I think our listeners will really writer. enjoy listening to that. Yeah. Um, so now, where can people here in the United States, especially, uh, find the book, order the book, Mecca Books? Okay. He's got he's got the he's got them. He'll be distributing it throughout America. Got it. And um, yeah. So people We're can go to the website and, and they can yeah. order the book. Yeah. Yeah. No. I really spent a time because I wanted to work with someone that I felt comfortable with. Yeah. And I, you know, reached out to quite a few people, but he was the only people, person that kind of kept a conversation going with me. And I felt we met over online and I just felt comfortable with him. I said, yeah, we can work together. Wonderful. Um, no, inshallah, like for our listeners, I mean, those who missed you on this tour, yeah. you know, get a copy of the book. Um, wait for your return, inshallah, next yeah. year so that you can autograph yeah. it. So, <laughs> it's a heavy I'm, book. It, it is. Three no, no, kilos. It, 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 it's that's a right. mighty book. <laughs> it is. It's uh, what do you call, like the coffee table book, but the, 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 this could probably substitute for a coffee table. Uh-huh. It's it, a it pretty is a substantial coffee book. Is it? And right. it was much bigger. I had to cut it really? down. And then when I realized it was going to weigh three kilos, I said, oh, my goodness, <laughs> how are we going to ship this around the world? And then we looked at, like, reducing the size, right. making a paper. I said, no, it has to be. Uh, As it is, it's about mountains. It's not a, it's not a trivial book. No, one of my prized possessions is, is yours. Is a signed copy of your "In the Shade of the Trees." So yeah, um, that's kind of got a revive yeah, revival yeah. since this one. People started. Buying that's right. Out I have one of the earliest. Uh, yeah, you were telling you me it was yeah. actually the first edition. Yeah. So that makes it even more of a prize for me. So um, I'm very uh, honored. Um, so I guess, and then where can is there. Where, where people can find your work in particular, like beyond the my book. website. Okay, my which website, is www.petersanders.com. Okay, it's quite. There's a lot of stuff on there, and I do apologize. We're going to cut it down a little bit and make it a bit more. But there's there's a lot of stuff. Is on there, there an opportunity for people to purchase uh, prints? Yeah, yeah, we can buy it. We can buy prints. You can buy books from us. I mean, we're okay. We're a small operation. It's just me and my wife. But uh, yeah, we. We do it, and we do exhibitions, and we do the workshops, which I love doing. Oh, As someone yeah. who never studied photography, I tell feel... us about that. So, so tomorrow, again, it, the the listeners will be way after, but yeah, tomorrow you are doing a workshop at Zaytuna. Yeah, so, I mean these are small workshops. Right. Generally, our workshops, I, do, I work with a young guy called Faisal from from Holland, and he kept on saying, you know, you need to do workshops. And I said, look, I, you organize them, I'll turn up. But, and then I felt like I never studied photography. How am I going to teach it? You know, like I feel a bit of a fraud. The only proper workshop I ever did was to learn, learn, learn to use large format 10 by right. 8 a Swiss camera called the Sinar, which I had to use in Mecca. But um, I did the first one and I thought, oh, I do know a little bit about photography. And I'm not, I'm not teaching people about technique right. it's about how to look at things how do you approach creation how do you look how do you get shot you know it's all about that and i teach about the masters whose shoulders we stand on from this great profession and cinematographers and i hmm. guide people in certain directions and that and so we, when we do them abroad they usually are like three or four days ah. we we so we do we do one in Granada in Spain every year. We have a hotel near the Alhambra. I do master classes in the morning. Mm. In the afternoon we go into the Alhambra and the students run around taking pictures on there to, if they need help. I have a couple of technicians with me. Come back to the hotel, they download stuff, the technicians help them edit their stuff. So over about three or four days their work just kind of really improves. And you know, I love it. Uh, it's such just, a lovely thing. Yeah. Though. And until you just mentioned it, I didn't even think my mind didn't even go to um, photography and cinematography. And yeah. you were talking of about course. some of the people it's who you admire. Light. Right. It's Painting all about light. light, understanding light. Painting with light, you said? Yeah. Is that a quote? Yeah. That's what uh, Storaro calls yeah, it. Yeah, Storaro. I talk about Storaro. Yeah. He's amazing. He was. You know, there's an well, incredible. You guys should talk <laughs> cinematography. There's, I should just move There is a away. story about Storaro yeah. that I tell my students because I. He is. I consider him a real master of cinematographer and, you know, he's worked on all the great films. 
But he himself tells a story. He talks a lot about the faculty of the imagination. Okay. Like when you think of something, you see it as an image, and then the thoughts about it come later. Was he an Italian? Cinematographer? Yeah, he's an Italian okay. cinematographer. He worked on he did Apocalypse. Last Emperor, Apocalypse Now, Reds. Yeah. I mean, the list of... He's, he's an amazing. He has a whole philosophy about light, and he studied the great masters and stuff. So anyway, he's telling this story about... And he's made, he made a film about Buddha. He made a film about Christianity and stuff. So he's telling a story. Someone gave him a book about the childhood of the Prophet Muhammad. Okay. And he's reading this book in a hotel somewhere. And he's reading it and he's imagining this in his mind. He finishes the book, closes the book, puts it on a coffee table, and a message comes in on his computer. And it's from Majid Majidi, the famous Iranian director. He said, I'm making a film about the childhood of the Prophet Muhammad. Hmm. Will you be the cinematographer? Huh. <laughs> How, how do you not just drop to your knees at that point and just say... And know. he said, he said the first thing I yeah. said to him is, will this film divide people or will it unite people? Mm. Look, the film's never been released because everybody's attacking it. Wow. Hm. Uh, so, and any of the other greats that you sort of look up to? Like, oh, many, uh, many. I mean, you need to come on the workshop where they really go on. <laughs> yeah. There's a couple called Roland and Sabrina Michelle. I think he's the sheikh of photography. Okay. He's not known. He's a Muslim. Him and his uh -huh. wife are Muslims. They uh -huh. live in Paris. And he went to Afghanistan before the wars and photographed beauty. I mean, he's a real master of photography. He's done mm. books all over the world. And he's a genius. I love him. And uh, we'd never met. I just followed his work from the late 60s. And, uh, and I thought... And he's, I knew it was very hard to get in touch with him. He's not like a modern... He's not a technophile. Got it. But then I thought, I'm getting on, he's getting on, I need to send him a message. So I sent him a fax or something and said, you know, I'm coming to Paris, love to meet you. Didn't hear anything. Then 10 days later, he calls up, he said, hi, it's Roland. Yeah, I'll be there. I'm traveling the next day. Come and have tea with us. So I went to his house in Paris. He opened the door. He said, what took you so long? And we spent like four hours chatting. We prayed together <laughs> and everything. Nice. He's 85. He's, well, he was 85 then. He's like, yeah, he's... He'd never use a digital camera. Didn't have a, doesn't have a phone. <laughs> never use emails. Yeah, mm. lovely guy. He's beautiful. Mm. So he's a great Don McCullen, the great war photographer. There are many, really. Yeah. I talk about all these people because you know our community doesn't know about all these. That's great right. That's right. People, and you need to study them. You need to study them because it's not enough just to be a good photographer. You need to be a human being as well, and that's really important. <laughs> I, I think just as as a way of sort of wrapping things up, I, you mentioned earlier about how uh, taking all these photographs, you've gained an insight into sort of various Muslim communities. Yeah. Uh, I would love to hear, you know, five decades, thousands and thousands of pictures. What has that taught you about humanity? Well, you have to have empathy and compassion for humanity. That's how all the shayuk look at us. Hmm. There's zero judgment. There's a lot of judgment goes on in our community and judgment of what, everything around them. But when you, when you meet these people, there is zero judgment. They just see you at a certain point in your spiritual journey. Right. If they see challenges in front of you, they'll pray for you. If you ask them anything, they'll give you advice. And that's, that's, that's the transaction. <laughs> and they don't say it's me. They just say they're signposts to God. It's not about, they're not trying to bring you to them. Right. It's, you know, their signpost. And that's really, you know, that transaction is really rare to find that. Especially at this time where ego is everything, where ego rules the world, you know, right. to find people completely devoid of that. See, I realise the whole selfie gener generation, I'm not, I'm not criticising selfies, but it's a kind of... It's people putting masks on or trying to find their own identity. Mm -hmm. This is me in this place. This is me eating this thing. Yeah. Right. When I photographed all these people, there's no mask. They are who they are. They, they're not trying to... Because Henry Cartier Bresson said, said, when you photograph somebody, they're naked in front of you. Not physically naked, right. but spiritually naked. Exposed. They're exposed. Yeah. And yeah. vulnerable. And vulnerable. Right. And that's why it was really... And sometimes I only had a very short time with some, some of these people... Oh, the guy on the cover was 125 when he died. Huh. You know, many of these people were in the 100, 106, 110. Right. So I didn't, you know, I, I had to be really prepared and just... But when they sit in front of you, they're 100% there. Mm. They're not on their phone, they're not thinking about something. They're just like, they're present with you. Right, right. And so it actually, 
It is difficult and it's not difficult <laughs> to get their images. That's beautiful. Nice. And, and, you know, uh, I, I don't know if you know this, but we're, we're recording at Tet Leaf and it, I think I'd be remiss not to say this because you, what you said reminds me of what Imam Zaid sort of coined our, what eventually kind of became our mission statement, as it were, which is, you know, come to us, uh, come as you are to Islam as it yeah, is. It's very he, he said that about Tetlif and we're recording at Tetlif, but what you just said is essentially that. Yeah, I think. Come as you are. These people are very it's real. It's like Rumi too, right? Yeah, yeah, these people are very real. They're very human. And, you know, and having come from India, I had a kind of false idea of what these people are like, but then you meet them, they're incredibly real. And I think that's very important, and we need to learn to be real too from them, you know. I don't think we could have ended on a more. Yeah. I was about to say. Yeah, that's right. Well, thank you so much for taking that's the time honor. out thank of this you. tour, uh, for making this stop on our little humble podcast. Well, it's but important. These things are important. Thank you for thinking that and for uh, just even giving us the time. That's obvious that you feel that way. Um, so I guess, Zeki, uh, if you want to wrap this up where people can find us and learn more about our show. Yeah, of course. Uh, please, uh, folks, if you if you uh, go to iTunes and leave a review, leave a star rating for our show, you can reach out to us via our Facebook page, facebook.com. Uh, no, wait. Yes. Yeah, facebook.com slash diffuse can you Diffuse can that's right. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's a, uh, and we have a new Twitter, a, a Twitter account now, we too. We do. It's at diffused C. Uh, C is in congruence. I feel like we should clarify that. Not uh, for a cookie. That, no. Uh, so, so please check that out and hit like on that and, and, and do what you gotta do there. And, and, uh, it, this has been such a thrill for, for both Pervez That's and right. I, I mean, uh, uh, being able to sit and just sort of, uh, just, just uh, pick your brain and, and you know, exactly. I mean, it's, it's, it's a real genuine thrill. So thank oh, you so man. much for sitting with us and, Pleasure. and, uh, we hope, uh, people will enjoy the show and we hope they will stick around for our next episode as well. Mm-hmm.